For the vast majority of Homo sapiens 200,000 years on this earth, the 148.9 million kilometers squared of land were open to all. Of course, some areas were significantly more habitable than others, but pockets of communally held lands and immense wildlands stretched the whole landscape. People lived communally and managed the lands they inhabited communally, in some form or another, whether they were sedentary or nomadic. Until a few centuries ago, custom-based and communal systems of land use existed across the globe. And yet when it comes to the question of the production and distribution end of the consumption of goods and services, when it comes to the question of how we organize the land we inhabit and the resources therein, economics, we're presented with two paths, privatization or nationalization, the capitalist or the state. Economics textbooks typically hold tables tabulating the pros and cons of capitalist enterprise and state ownership. Private ownership is seen as beneficially competitive, though capitalism naturally trends toward monopoly as the reinvestment of capital ever raises the cost of entry. Nationalization is celebrated for protecting national resources from foreign exploitation, despite maintaining local exploitation. Private ownership is extolled for its immunity to political influence. Yet capitalists and politicians, when they aren't one and the same, work hand in hand to meet their shared interests. State ownership may maintain the accessibility of essential services, as with healthcare or education, but that which it gives, it is just as capable of taking away or limiting through means tests. Private ownership supposedly keeps taxes low Yet the wealthy benefit the most from said low taxes, while the cost of living escalates for the average person. And while state ownership may raise the standard of living in the nation through the revenue it generates, much of that wealth still concentrates at the top. Both privatization and nationalization typically maintain a short-term, myopic view of success. Capitalists are focused on the immediate fiscal year and generating profits for their shareholders, while politicians are focused on their political career and what quick publicity gains they can make within the electoral cycle. Both nationalization and privatization accept as a central tenet that power must remain in the hands of the few over the many. This critique isn't meant to be exhaustive or detailed, but it is meant to provide a cursory illustration of the limitations this dichotomy leaves us with, between a rock and a hard place. We can certainly debate which is worse, and personally, I believe privatization is much worse, but the reality is that whether the land and resources are held in the hands of a capitalist or a bureaucrat, the masses of working class people are alienated from control regardless. Furthermore, under the global capitalist status quo, there is no real separation between the capitalists and the state. It is one smooth criminal, I mean, one smooth machine. And just a side tangent, when people attempt to criticize communism by pointing to the environmental disasters under nationalization in state socialist projects like the USSR, defenders of state socialism typically retort with arguments that outline the unacknowledged benefits of those projects, buried by Cold War era propaganda. But the issue is that nationalization was never the aim of communism in the first place. The Bolsheviks may have made that bastardized understanding of communism globally notorious after crushing alternatives, and you can extol all the positive outcomes of those projects and ignore all the negatives if you'd like, but the reality is the aim of communism is to socialize, not nationalize, the means of production. I know these terms have been used as synonyms because far too many purposefully treat the government and its people as interchangeable, but they couldn't be more different. To nationalize industry, means to give it to the nation state and make it obedient to the wishes of those in charge of government. Whereas to socialize industry means to give it to the society, to the workers themselves, making it subservient to the direct will of the people. The aim of anarchism and communism is the direct popular control and management of resources, not government ownership. But I digress. The problem is that we're presented with two sides of the same coin. Any mention of the commons, of social ownership in the true sense of the term, is relegated to the greatly deplored tragedy of the commons. 
which despite being thoroughly dissected decades ago, despite being contradicted by millennia of human existence, endures in some circles as a justification for why no matter what, the people themselves cannot manage the land and resources. Check the scenario. Commonly owned pasture, every local herdsman can graze their cattle. The idea is that a herder, acting in isolation, would try to take advantage of the additional short-term individual benefits gained by introducing more than his allotted share of cattle to the common pasture, despite the damage that overgrazing would cause to the whole. And if all herders made this individually rational economic decision, the commons would most definitely be depleted or even destroyed, ending all their livelihoods. The term tragedy of the commons was first coined by white supremacist, eugenicist, and neo malthusian ecologist Garrett Hardin in 1968, who popularized the scenario with a focus on human population growth, the use of the Earth's natural resources, and the welfare state. He bemoaned the overbreeding of particular races, classes, and religions, and deplored the welfare state for supporting said overbreeding. Hardin's assertions had the neoclassical economics baked in assumption that these farmers were necessarily atomized, unorganized, and unable to recognize certain disaster and change their behavior accordingly. They required enlightened elites, whether capitalist or bureaucrat, though most likely capitalist, to step in and ameliorate the situation. The popularity of his article rose in tandem with the widespread implementation of neoliberal policies in the 1970s, and his arguments were cited heavily by those who wished to privatize nationalized industries and eliminate long-standing communal institutions. The so-called tragedy of the commons did not actually reflect historical or current practice. The free-for-all, destructive hypothetical proposed by Hardin was incongruent with the carefully managed, long-enduring commons of reality. The reality is that under capitalism, property is not valued for itself or for its utility. It's valued for the revenue it produces for its owner. And if that capitalist can maximize the revenue by destroying that property, they have the right to do so. The reality is that under capitalism, we can see that a person's desire for profit outweighs their interest in their community's long-term survival. But that perspective cannot be universally projected. It's a perspective born out of and strongly incentivized by capitalism. In contrast, Communal ownership incentivizes the protection and maintenance of common resources for future generations, similar to the seven generations principle of sustainability in the constitution of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The rich and the powerful will continue to use the tragedy of the commons to justify their theft, destruction, and enclosure of the commons and communal life. Because without the commons and the community bonds that maintain them, we have no other recourse but to sell our labor to those same rich and powerful to survive. That's why land and liberty, tierra y libertad, has been so common a revolutionary demand. But how did we get here? What happened to our commons? How did this theft occur? How has the potent alternative present in the commons been so wiped from our collective memory? It goes back to the feudal concept of land ownership, the age of European colonialism, and of course, the rise of industrial capitalism. The King of England, for example, owned all the land in feudal England, but bestowed titles for pledges of loyalty to powerful members of the nobility that allowed them to rule over large estates. These lords leased the land they were given to aristocrats, who also leased parts of their land as payment for military aid or for rent. This rigidly hierarchical system of obligation between landed lords and their tenants or vassals, reinforced the monarchy's ability to stake claim on the land in their kingdom. However, at the bottom of this system were the peasants, who did all the actual work on the common land of the lord's estate. Many were generationally serfs, legally prohibited from leaving the land they cultivated without their lord's permission. Lords may have come and gone, but their bondage to the land was basically forever. After the Magna Carta, the Black Death, the Crusades, and all the other dramas that brought feudalism in decline, the nobility initiated a process of privatization that laid the groundwork for early capitalism through acquisitions, settlement, and enclosure of the commons. 
But even though revolutions and reforms came and went, and most of us have gotten rid of our inbred kings and queens and their right to rule, the concept of sovereignty over private parcels of land and the feudal relationship of landlord and tenant has endured to this day, exported globally through European colonialism. Despite this violent and antisocial theft of our access to even the means of subsistence, some commons have survived and thrived, though they operate within the constraints of the state and the global capitalist status quo. Still, there is a lot we can learn from them when it comes to how to manage the commons. Why have they succeeded where others have failed in maintaining their commons? All efforts to organize collective action, including the commons, must address a common set of problems. How to supply new institutions, how to solve commitment issues, and how to maintain stability. It's not easy. And yet some individuals have created institutions, committed themselves to following the rules they've come up with together, and assessed their own and others' conformance to those rules in order to maintain the stability of their shared commons. Again, why have they succeeded where others have failed? External factors seem to play a significant role. Some have far more autonomy than others to change their own institutions, while others have change happen too rapidly for them to respond and adjust. Regardless, people try their best to solve the problems they face, despite their limitations. What factors help or hinder them in these efforts is a matter of careful study if we wish to succeed in organizing and running our own commons. But first, we need to clarify some definitions. The commons are based on a common pool resource, or CPR, which is a natural or man-made resource system that benefits a group of people, but which provides diminished benefits to everyone if each individual pursues their own self-interest. We must draw a further distinction between the resource system and the resource units produced by the system. Resource systems include forests, crown water basins, irrigation canals, lakes, fisheries, pastures, and even infrastructure like windmills and the internet, while resource units consist of whatever users appropriate from their resource systems, such as cubic meters of lumber harvested and water withdrawn, tons of fish harvested and fodder grazed, kilowatts generated, and net worth bandwidth used. It's also important to maintain the renewability of a resource system by ensuring that the average rate of withdrawal does not exceed the average rate of replenishment. The term appropriators refers to those who withdraw resource units from a resource system, like a fisher or farmer. Appropriators may use the resource units they withdraw, like residents powering their homes or farmers watering their crops, or they may transfer the resource units for others to use, such as a logger sending lumber to a hardware store for sale. Those who arrange for the provision of a CPR through financing or design are providers while producers are those who actually construct, repair, and sustain the resource system itself. Providers, producers, and appropriators are often all the same people. Appropriators who share a CPR are deeply intertwined in a tapestry of interdependence. Acting selfishly and independently will usually obtain less benefit than they could have had they organized collectively in some way. The process of organizing enables us to coordinate and change our shared situations to obtain higher shared benefits and reduce shared harm. Some of the commons institutions that endure today are as old as over a thousand years, while others are a few hundred at most. They exist alongside the personal property of the appropriators involved, such as their crops and livestock, but have remained at the core of these communities' economies for generations. They have survived droughts, floods, wars, pestilences, and many major economic and political changes. From the alpine meadows of Torbell, Switzerland, to the 3 million hectares of Japanese forest, to the irrigation systems of Spain and the Philippines, these projects have evolved over time in response to experience and circumstance. None of them are perfect demonstrations of anarchy or anything, nor are they necessarily the most optimal by some metrics but they are successful in establishing a level of autonomy and resilience in the people involved in them, and they've managed to carefully maintain the ecology of the regions they inhabit. These institutions exist in different settings and have different histories, yet they simultaneously share fundamental similarities. 
Unpredictable and complex environments, combined with engineering and farming skills, combined with a predictable population over an extended period of time. These fairly egalitarian communities have developed extensive norms that define proper behavior involving honesty and reliability, allowing them to live without excessive conflict in a deeply interdependent environment. The perseverance of these institutions is due to the seven, and in some cases eight, key principles that Eleanor Ostrom outlines in governing the commons. First and foremost, the commons need clearly defined boundaries. Those involved should have a clear sense of the exact structure and characteristics of the resource system itself, whether through generationally preserved folk knowledge or extensive scientific study, as well as knowledge of who is involved in withdrawing from and sustaining it. Secondly, the appropriation and provision rules of the commons must be compatible with local conditions. In order to maintain the renewability of a common pool resource, there needs to be some restrictions in place. Thirdly, those involved in the commons need to have collective decision-making power over the commons. They should be the ones that come up with and modify the rules of the commons when needed, not external authorities. However, it's not enough to collectively come up with the rules. There has to be some commitment from those bound by them to stay bound by them, even when temptations arise. Shared norms regarding behavior and reputation concerns can help, but you also need the fourth and fifth principles established in some form to effectively maintain social harmony. The fourth principle is monitoring, which is the process of continuously evaluating the conditions of the CPR itself, as well as the behavior of the appropriators. Through this process, individuals learn what rules work and what rules don't, and they're able to keep each other accountable. In these sorts of situations, opportunistic people may be tempted to take advantage of the trust presence in the group. So the fifth principle necessary for successful commons management is the practice of accountability through graduated sanctions. Empathy should be maintained throughout the process, of course, but infractions definitely vary in severity. In some situations, when infractions are temporary deviations or unthreatening to the survival of the CPR, tolerance can be high. But in other situations, when the livelihood of the entire community is at stake, things can be so easy. The sixth principle is the presence of conflict resolution mechanisms. Humans are gonna human. We make mistakes, we have disagreements, and there needs to be some sort of means of discussing and resolving conflict in a healthy and effective way. The seventh principle is the freedom to organize. In some places, people have a whole lot more autonomy to self-organize free of state control than others. Our aim is, of course, the abolition of the state entirely. But in the meantime, having a government that does not encroach on these projects, especially in their fragile early stages, helps tremendously. The eighth and final principle for successful commons management involves nested enterprises. It's basically the same principle as anarchist confederation. Bottom-up organization that maintains power at the local level while coordinating larger scaled commons at the regional level and beyond. With these principles in place, based on the experience and case studies of several existing institutions, I believe we can effectively govern the commons. But how do we get started? The creation of new institutions can sometimes be quite easy and other times quite difficult. The costs involved are going to vary depending on the resource system you're trying to bring under common control and it can be difficult to get past the early stages of organizing due to burnout, apathy and lack of commitment. But it's best to view this process as a process. It's incremental but not abrupt. We'll need people involved creating and acting upon visions to transform their local situation for a better future. We'll need systems thinking to best evaluate the circumstances we're in so that we can chart the best course of action. We'll need to adapt to hiccups and disruptions that will inevitably occur during this building process. And we'll need to confront and work to uproot systems that get in the way. And we'll need the courage to keep going no matter what. The commons are an important foundation upon which a new, free society will be built. As I mentioned before, I think existing commons projects have been limited by the circumstances of global capitalism. 
but I think the values that underline the commons can be expanded far more than they have been thus far. The commons that exist today are primarily based on agriculture, but we could also introduce the principles of the commons to housing cooperatives, utility cooperatives, and expansions of the library concept. Imagine transforming neighborhoods and apartment complexes into truly social institutions that cooperate to build, maintain, and provide housing as an irreducible minimum to all. Picture libraries run by communities that are able to provide all the tools, appliances, and equipment necessary for shared living in a solarpunk future. The wealth of this planet should be shared by us all, and the real tragedy of the commons is the loss thereof to the elite few. All power to all the people. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with your fellow peoples. Thanks once again, of course, to the family, including our newest members, Courtney Volt, Graham Arthur, Akil Chinsang, and Kaylin Foster. Join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out all my other videos for a range of radical topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore true. Thanks again. Peace.